Hello out there, viewers or listeners. I'm Ryan. I'm Jeff. Welcome to Stirring Up the Lees, a show where we like to stir the proverbial pot of the wine industry, trying to provoke uh, wine lovers, wine drinkers, wine enthusiasts alike, as we delve a little deeper into this beverage we all find so interesting. On today's episode, we're drinking boxed wine. Like ballers. Oh. All right, Jeff, thanks for this wine. We should, uh, we should talk about it. Delve in. Yeah, the first one we have here is the... Well, wait, well, sorry. Should we talk about the format, bag and box, before we kind of jump into the, the one? Yeah, we could. It's, yeah, you know, bibs, I guess, as the kids call it. Bibs. Actually, they call it, they call it uh, goon in Australia. Goon? Yeah, like uh, it'll get you gooned or I don't know. Is that a term for getting wrecked? I don't, I'm not sure the etymology, but... I I'd certainly know that there's like drinking games associated with goon in which consumption of the whole bag is required. So by one person or by how many people are we talking? Uh, one person. So four liters of wine for one person. Yeah. Within what time span? Uh, you assume an evening. Okay, so I have a full evening. Yeah. Maybe an hour. That's not bad. But anyways, speaking of goon. Uh, the bag and box was actually first patented in Australia. Interesting. A place I guess that has a lot of wine inventions? Sure. Uh, they just like drinking, actually, I think. It's and this is the, the format, if you want to drink. Absolutely. So it was this fella, Tom Ango, I want to say. Okay. So, uh, winery in South, South Australia, I think it still exists. Um, he patented the first one, I think it was in the late 1930s, but it's actually not quite the same as what we know it today, because it was just a bag in a box. You know, like it didn't have the spigot? No spigot. That, that came like 30 years later. That was patented by actually another Australian dude. But so it was just like this bag in a box. Uh, you had to cut the bag. Oh, like those two liter milk bags? Yeah, yeah, Canadians out there will know that come from places uh, that have bags. In know. Ontario, maybe, yeah. So there was probably somebody in the household that was in charge of cutting the bags because... Oh, there's an appointed bag cutter. For people that have never had bag milk, we should probably point, point out that if you make a haphazard cut on a bag of milk, consider your breakfast ruined. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If there's an art to it. Oh, yeah. So anyways, you cut a hole in this bag, and there was like a special peg, which is probably like a clothespin, I would think, that you would use to seal it. Right, but you saw the oxygen in there for Yeah, the you, you don't have the benefits of the modern day bag in a box. But you have the benefits still of the quantity, the sheer quantity. Which is probably the most important part of a bag in a box. Alright, so what are we drinking here, Jeff? First wine we're going to taste today is the 2019 Pinot Grigio from Boda Box from the state of California. And it's interesting, a lot of the top selling wines now are these bag and box brands that have kind of recently emerged on the scene. And why do we see more bag and box wines now? I think there's obviously an environmental impact with bottling in glass. Uh, there's also bulk shipping versus shipping in glass bottles and cases. So let's dive into that a little bit. I mean, when we think of a bottle of wine, the glass alone, forget the wine itself, is 400 grams to over a kilo in some cases, but the average is 500 grams, is that right? Yeah, I think I read an article it was like 500 grams, but that's just the, the bottle alone. Then you gotta count the liquid inside. Versus bag and box, I mean, the packaging itself is, is pretty negligible. We're talking maybe 100 grams, a couple hundred grams, the wine, obviously. So we're saving all of that freight. But not even like the weight of the freight itself, but also the space, because yes. we're shipping this wine typically in bulk. Yeah, if I give you a shipping container and I say, fill it full, you're not going to put in cylindrical <laughs> bottles. You're going to put in boxes, you're going to put in some sort of dry good that you can fill to the absolute capacity of that sh uh, shipping container. Because if I'm ordering in a container of wine from a fancy chateau in Bordeaux, what a container can take 21 pallets of wine, 56 cases per pallet, let's call it. Like 
oh, just slightly over 10,000 liters versus right. shipping in bulk, you could do over 20, well over 20. 24,000 liters roughly, let's call it. So a significant difference, over double the amount of wine. Uh, but this is also for wines that are meant to be consumed kind of within a year after packaging. Right. Like kind of the, you know, 90 something percent of wine that's produced globally, that's meant to be drank, year, the year it's packaged. Right. Versus the, the higher quality, higher tier wine markets that's kind of meant for the aging. And the reason that we do bottle wine where the producer is located, the winery itself, I mean, that alone is a relatively new innovation. We didn't see that until the 20th century. And the simple reason why it started was somewhat quality driven, but also a factor of authenticity. The fact that you could put a stamp and say, this came from a top Bordeaux Chateau, and you didn't have to worry about forgeries or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, when you think of other beverage alcohols, you think of beer, and just talking about Budweiser, like it's brewed globally. And obviously that has an environmental impact. It's greatly decreased uh, shipping dry goods, dry malt, dry barley, dry hops across the world's oceans than it is shipping cans of Budweiser, you know? But it's interesting, when we think of beer, we think of a recipe, I think, and then wine is some, um, you know, it's on another pedestal. Yeah. The top fine wines, you know, I think there's a case there why it should be bottled at the winery itself. But these wines, at the end of the day, we almost are talking more of a recipe too. Yeah, yeah, there's certainly a recipe involved with this level of winemaking, this production volume of winemaking. But at the same time, the grapes are still, whether it's a massive sea of grapes in Southern California, it's still coming from California. And you'll also see some bag and box that are blends of multiple countries, yeah. which speaks to that recipe where you're just trying to nail a very specific flavor profile. So I think the person picking this box up off the shelf is less interested in provenance, winemaking. Ultimately, they want something that's at an affordable price, that's drinkable, and that is easy to consume. Yeah, they just want a glass of wine. Maybe they want a glass of wine every night for three weeks straight. You know, and you can't yeah, do so that now. with a, you can, yeah, exactly, me too. You can't do that with a bottle. Because when you open it, maybe you got a day, maybe you got a two, in some cases three or four, but you don't have the longevity of, of uh, bag and box format. Now, the one thing we haven't done is really talked with this wine a lot. Uh, I think there's a reason though. I mean, this is, Pretty generic white wine. I think basically the reason we just dove into a separate topic is because this wine is doing exactly what it's made for. You pour a glass of wine and we've just been sipping it and just talking about things, you know? Perfectly, it's drinkable. Yeah, we're, it's not made to have two guys sit in a room and we don't need to contemplate it. poetic about it. It's, it's white wine. The, the tasting note, I don't think there's fruit descriptors. I think it's just White wine. White wine. Full stop. I also think uh, we may be drinking this wrong. Oh, what do you what do you mean? Not the right glass. Should it be like? That? Oh, hello. Uh. <laughs> oh man, greatly improved. I know for a fact this is how my grandma drinks her box <laughs> wine, so there's got to be something to it. So it's in the fridge, it's cold already, but... It's going to be ice cold, baby. It's going to be ice cold. Yeah. That's kind of like getting back to beer again when you think of Coors Light, and it's like uh, certified cold. Remember those cans they did where it changed color when it was a uh, like, temperature yeah. of maximum appreciation? It's like, well, we chill it down so that you can your sensory bribe of it, but... You can't taste it. And I think what's interesting here, though, there's nothing that I find offensive. There's no obvious winemaking flaws or faults. There is some noticeable residual sugar. It's about nine grams per liter residual sugar. If anything, the ice cube helps to just dilute that down. Absolutely, yeah, I, I get like a bit of astringency, so obviously they're probably cropping it high and Ten trying minutes. to get as much as they can out of those clusters. 
which is fair and it's a great business model, but you can you can taste it on the end product. Yeah. So they're using a bit of that residual sugar to hide that and uh, it's working for me. I, I I can see this going down on a beach, on a hike maybe, maybe you not me, but some, <laughs> someone on a hike and... Like my wife and I will go backcountry camping and we'll hike in because we're not going to carry three, four, it's three liters, right? This, this particular bag and block, so we're not carrying that weight in bottles on a hike. So it's great for that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let's move on to the next wine. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, guys and gals. So not only do Jeff and I stir up the leaves together, but we also curl together. And there's a little story I want to talk to you about that's kind of pertaining to this video. During a bond spiel, which is a curling tournament, I was not fortunate enough to partake in. There was a door prize that was a handmade wine urn, a pottery wine urn that came with a bag and a box wine. And legend goes that Jeff told his teammates, if we win this door prize, we are drinking that entire bag this evening. And history shows us that they did, and they were incredibly regretful as such. So I'm curious to see, I don't know that he still has it, but I'm interested to know if there's a bag in the box that encourages him to bring it out tonight. Well, Jeff, what's the next one? So next we're gonna taste the Black Box Cabernet Sauvignon. Black Sobion. Box? Black Box, like an airplane. Like an airplane, Black Box. This has its own mysteries. Much like, uh, a, <laughs> much like, much a like an airplane box. black box. One mystery to me, it doesn't taste a lot like Cabernet. Uh, it's uh, red wine with it's a red wine stuff in it. There's yeah, some fake oak. It's all it's almost coming across like you, you know you bake cookies or whatever. You put that artificial vanilla extract in. Right. It almost smells like that. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt saying that they use perhaps a higher quality product, but... But we're not talking barrels, to be clear. No, no. No, like, the, there's a, I think there's an oak influence to this wine, but it's certainly not from seeing a nice oak barrel or a right. oak, a large oak, oak vat. I mean, and to that point, there's probably some mystery to the winemaking, potentially, as well. Obviously, there's some different considerations from a winemaking perspective when we're looking at bag and box versus a traditional bottled wine. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there'd be processes, there'd be processes pre-fermentation that you're treating uh, grapes, juice, must with at a production level this high to kind of expedite the process and keep your inputs low. Mm -hmm. But one of the things the big things that I've read about for bag and box format is that you don't get the oxygen ingress you would when you're using a cork in a bottle. And actually you still, even with a screw cap, you can still get oxygen ingress. Mm -hmm. So what they have to do is essentially like oxygenate the wine. So like throwing the wine in a decanter. Yeah, like essentially that I think they use like a centrifuge or something, to whip it around and, and get like so a, a little a little less sexy maybe yeah than the maybe but... a little less sexy uh, but just basically to get some oxygen in that wine give it some life because if it's going in a bag it's it's hermetically sealed you know it's it's right. never seeing the light of day again and certainly while you're drinking it when you open it there's not that cork pull there's not you know it, you you're just siphoning it from a bag that's enclosing it on itself and there's no air ever getting into it. So I think they go through these steps to, to, to make it jump out at you in the glass. Right. But there is nothing quite like the magical sound of pulling a spigot out of a cardboard box. That's my favorite sound. For the first time. <laughs> Pull the spigot out. People wax on about it like pulling the cork. And you know, but it's all about the spit. It's cracking, really? you know, it's the press here, and you press in, you hear the crunch of the cardboard. In that sense of adventure, because I feel like every time I'm trying to pour a glass from a spigot, it's like, 
is it going to get in my glass? I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> don't, you don't have that It's confidence. like, it's, it's uh, to be profane, it's like, you know, uh, I've pulled the spigot out. I don't know that I'm going to not wee all over myself. Sometimes you soak and pray. But uh, there's certainly, there's certainly bag and box drinkers out there that are m more seasoned than you and I, I would say. No doubt. There's no doubt. We have a lot to learn still. Absolutely. So again, with this wine, uh, when we touched on the white wine, um, Central, Central Valley, California, this would be Central Valley, Chile. We're still in the oven. We're still in the oven. We're still in the bulk market. You know, we're pumping mass, mass quantities of grapes off individual vines. And, uh, I mean, I'm, I'd still drink this. I would drink it. I like the, the first, the Pinot Grigio, a little bit better. To me, and I don't know if you agree or not, I find cheaper whites on the whole a little bit more successful than cheaper reds. Because oftentimes, red producers are trying to make this into something that's not. Absolutely. This is not Napa Cabernet. This is not Napa Cabernet Asian barrels, Asian French oak barrels, Asian French oak barrels for 24 months. <laughs> this is Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon. They would maybe put in a stainless steel tank for yeah. four weeks. I mean, when you think about the processes, some of the greatest white wines of the world are made in quite, like obviously there's some dissimilarities, but they're made in a, a quite a similar fashion as the white wine would be. Whereas with red wines, there's a lot of things to emulate when it comes to the winemaking process in order to come across as uh, a higher quality product. Mm -hmm. Right now, Jeff, uh, anything else you want to add to this wine? You know, I just don't know if we're enjoying this properly still. What do you mean? Are you getting it? Are you getting another <coughs> ice cube for me? I don't think it needs a. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> the urn! This is the wine urn. <laughs> Handmade quality shit we're talking. Amazing. Let's see how it tastes now. <laughs> oh, it's remarkably better. So, with this, have you put any like, like amazing bags of wine in this urn? It's a great question, because actually today we tried two of the most popular, maybe entry level bag and box brands. But there is some legitimately good wine in boxes right now. Some producers like taking the format seriously, putting some good product in it. They see the purpose. They see the environmental benefit. They see the cost benefit. Well, and they see they could have their wine in an urn like this. Well. And that's a no-brainer <laughs> to almost anyone. <laughs> Cheers to the <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Well, thanks for watching, everybody. On the next episode of Stirring Up the Lees, we're drinking more boxed wine. More boxed wine. Like ballers. We couldn't get enough of it. And it's all we can afford. I don't know. <laughs> Regardless, next time, we're tasting the same wine, one bag of box and one in bottle. Very interesting. And we'll see if there's a difference. Bit v. Biddle. Yeah, the ultimate <laughs> battle. <laughs> the ultimate battle. Uh, if you guys like that video, hit the like button. If you uh, if you want to subscribe, you know, tap away like you would spigot of a bag and box. And if you have questions about bag and box, throw them in the comments.